up everybody, AxeWizard here. I uh, wanted to do a quick video on a question that I've gotten a few times about the Cairn system. That is, can you do a long-term campaign with Cairn? I'm talking like months to years long campaign. The TLDW, the Too Long Didn't Watch, is, in my opinion, yes. Now, I feel kind of weird saying that because I only discovered the Cairn system like a month or two ago. Obviously, I haven't had the opportunity to run a long-term campaign with it, but I've played it quite a bit. I've definitely got a few hours under my belt with it. I've got some thoughts. So let me let me explain why I think that you could use you could absolutely run a long-term campaign with this super lightweight Cairn system. Let's talk about forms of progression, because I think that is the one of the key parts of a long-term campaign. Immediately, some forms of progression that come to mind are simple things, like number go up, right? If you're used to D&D uh, &D or Pathfinder systems, progression in that manner is fairly obvious, right? Especially like in Pathfinder, like... Uh, you know, if you're a level two character, you've got like 17 armor class, you've got like 20 something hit points. But if you're a level 20 character, you've got like 47 armor class and uh, or 37 or 40 or something like that. You've got like 200 health or something insane, right? Just astronomically big numbers compared to what you were before. So your gameplay session at level two will be like, you know, you rolling dice and, you know, maybe you get to add like plus six or plus eight for a modifier. And then next thing you know, when you're level 20, you're doing like, oh, I get to roll the hit plus 45. Like, I feel like a badass, right? That is a pretty big, obvious sense of progression. So that's one factor that comes into it is number go up, right? I think that is an important thing for any game, whether tabletop or not. Like, you know, you look at uh any like video games for example right like uh world of warcraft uh especially like classic and be said because the current game has scaling and stuff in it but you start out like, like level one you know you're you're doing damage to these wolves or, or or whatever you're fighting wolves boars kobolds you know you might be able to take them out in like three or four hits and then you level up a little bit you come back next thing you know you're like one-shotting them right that gives you a meaningful sense of progression like oh my god i'm getting stronger now Another key part of progression is going to be skills, abilities, and like spells and things like that. So, you know, for example, like in Pathfinder or D&D, as you level up, you get access to like, you know, more feats or you get uh, more class abilities or, uh, you know, different features as you, you level up. So like uh, barbarians might get cooler things when they rage. They might be able to rage more often. They might be able to uh, rage longer or, or whatever, you know? Those are forms of progression to where as your character not only has number go up, but also, you know, you can do more things. You have more tools in your toolkit. You have more abilities. You have more uh, skills, you know, especially like for, for Pathfinder and like D&D &D, where you have like a, a set of skills actually defined and you have like these modifiers. So it's like, oh, I, I want to roll for stealth or I want to roll, you know, perception or uh, I want to roll a deception check or something like that. If your character's skilled in that, then you have a higher chance of, of doing that. So that's another form of progression is expanding your toolkit, having more skills, more things at your disposal. Another key factor of progression, I think, is also items. Like getting really cool items is a really awesome way of like feeling some progression. Like, and, and again, that goes with like video games too. Like you're playing like a, a RPG and you get a sweet two handed axe that can just obliterate stuff. That is a pretty big milestone step. Like there, there, I'm sure if you've played uh, tabletop RPGs for any duration, you've probably run into some massively overpowered items <laughs> that your DM or GM probably regrets giving you. <laughs> so, items is another meaningful form of progression. So you might you might uh, fight the big bad, and you might search his castle, and you find his ancient treasure trove, and maybe you find some cool goodies for the entire party so the cleric might get this cool you know wand that has like healing spells and stuff on it so they can heal more um, without having to burn up their own spell slots uh you know just things like that uh wizards 
wizards might get something that will um, allow them to concentrate on two things at once so they can hold up to two concentration spells. That's a pretty damn big thing, right? That's a that's a pretty huge uh, thing of like progression. I've been playing a lot of Diablo Four in my spare time, so it's like you're trying to find the right gear that gives you the stats you want, and then also like legendary aspects that give you like these sweet um, buffs to your abilities that make them do different things. So items uh, itemization, I think, is a, is another big form of uh, progression that uh, players want to feel uh when you know when they are doing a long-term campaign and the the last form of progression that off the top of my head i think is important is story development like campaign narrative um in order for players to do a long-term campaign they have to love their characters they have to love the world that they're in otherwise it's kind of a drag and it's probably not going to last long so if characters are excited about, or if players are excited about the characters they are playing, and they're excited about the impact their character has on the world, and their character is fun to play, that is, is also a meaningful form of progression. An example of that might be something like, you know, you're starting out, maybe you're like some lowly adventurers, and you guys are discover some sinister plot that's gonna destroy a village. Maybe you find some cultists that are summoning some demons or whatever, and you guys go down there and break up this cultist party and save the village from being annihilated by demons. Well, guess what? You've probably made an impact in those villagers' lives. They probably like you. Maybe they might uh, they might offer you some special services that they don't offer anybody. Maybe they might uh, give you your own place to stay, so you don't have to pay like a uh, you know. Uh, at a tavern maybe you might get free drinks at the uh, tavern maybe you might uh you might uh get uh, special rewards from them you, you get like uh de deferential treatment from them right maybe uh maybe you get fame and renown and other people start asking for you so that is also a meaningful form of progression that's like hey we're not nobodies anymore we're kind of a big deal around here you, you don't know who i am you better ask around right like it's that's a pretty big form of of progression so i think those four things number go up more skills more abilities more spells itemization and then story like uh, narrative uh, uh progression i think those four things are essential for like a long-term campaign at least uh, it, in my mind anyway there's probably more but i think if we just boil it down to those four um I think that would cover a lot of the bases of what players are looking for who typically play long-term campaigns. So if we look at the Cairn system, what do we have? So for Cairn, first things first, let's take a look at page one. It says Cairn was written with the following design philosophies in mind. One big thing is obviously uh, characters are classless, right? A character's role or skills are not limited by a single class. Instead, the equipment they carry and their experiences defines their speciality. So right off the bat, we can take a look at that and we can say, all right, well, itemization is probably going to be a huge form of progression in, in Cairn. So the next thing says death. Characters may, may be powerful, but they are also vulnerable to harm in its many forms. Death is always around the corner, but it is never random or without warning. So that is, I think, especially important because if you're going into Cairn thinking that you're going to have a long-term campaign like you can with something like Pathfinder to where you're going to come back to your hometown at level 20 and ransack uh, the place because they can't even touch you like they physically can't even hit you because your armor class is too high your your saves are all too high they literally cannot touch you the only hope that they would have of even doing damage to you is if they try to rig up a trap that's something like oh i have to make a dexterity save or something like that to dodge like a, a falling log hitting me that's like the only way in cairn it's not that way so Let's take a look at the number go up aspect of Cairn. So right off the bat, numbers are a lot lower. It's not going to be like Pathfinder where you've got, you know, 600 health, 45 armor class, plus 85 to your save. None of that, right? It's a D20 roll under system. There's no adding modifiers. So immediately right there, you're basically capped at like 20. Like that would be the maximum. Now, it's even less than that because you still want to have a little room for failure. So if you look at a lot of the systems in uh, Cairn, 
they typically have you like rolling something like, you know, 3d6 to determine what your stats are. So that means that you can have a maximum of 18. Whenever, if you take a look at the scars table, most of the scars, if you're re-rolling your hit protection, which is one of the meaningful forms of progression inside of, uh, of the, the Cairn system, is scars. Your character gets um, stronger, not by leveling up and counting experience points, but by the scars that they receive from various combat encounters. There's a few other ways I'm going to get into it later. So that's not the only form of progression in Cairn, but some people take a look at the rules and think that that's the only form of, of progression. I can see why they think that, but there's some other ways that, that you can do. It's just it maybe not as spelled out as clearly. So the scars table... A lot of the stuff is like, you know, for the for the earlier scars, it's like roll 1d6. If the total is higher than your starting hit protection, uh, you take that new amount as your maximum hit protection. So, uh, you know, if you roll your character and you roll two for your starting hit protection and you get your first scar and you get to roll 1d6 and if that rolls higher, even a three number go up, that's a meaningful form of progression. It might not be as pronounced if you're like really big into numbers like you know it's not like it's not going to be like diablo 3 where you're hitting mobs for like 48 trillion damage <laughs> like it's not good not going to be like that right so even that small incremental increase is huge in the world of 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 cairn because danger is so prevalent so a lot of the combat encounters players will normally try to avoid or uh circumvent those encounters by in, in defeating them with like non-combat means so you know for example you might come into a bad guy's base and you might see him there and you could just run in and charge him and you know try to deal damage to him and get his hip protection down and then deal deal critical damage and maybe he gets his strength down and he fails his uh his critical saves and then he's out for the count and you know maybe you get some scars so you can progress and then you know maybe you get some cool loot so you got that that progression there that's one way of of doing it and that's what I think a lot of players will do at the start. But then once they start getting more used to playing Cairn, they might try to do various things. They might say like, hey, using my background as like a hunter, can I try to rig up like some trap with uh, stuff that we have around? Like this is like a ruined building. I see like some rolled up wire or something over there. Like, can I, can I mess with stuff? You know, in a given time, you can rig up various encounters that do things in your favor that may prevent the boss from... Uh, attacking uh, back at the players. You might think that, well, if scars are progression, why would the players be incentivized to do that? Doesn't that mean that that would be hampering their progression? You, you might think that um, if you're only, if you're looking at scars as the only form of progression, but there's not. So let's go back to page one again. So if we read the section on growth, Characters are changed through in-world advancement, gaining new skills and abilities by surviving dangerous events and overcoming obstacles. Trivializing a boss encounter through quick wit and ingenuity and, you know, making it so they don't really even have to fight them. They might not get scars that way, but that doesn't mean that, that they still can't progress. You as the warden will have to make sure that uh, the players receive uh, progression if, you know, especially if they're doing their best to not get in combat encounters, you as the warden have to make sure that your players are still experiencing some form of progression. Now, what are some ways that, that we can do that? Let's, uh, let's take a look at character creation, right? So let's take a look at the, the character traits, right? So say, for example, you have a character and maybe you're rolling for physique, you roll a D10 and you roll a three. So you get flabby, right? Maybe while you're rolling your stats, you might have maybe your dexterity is a is a bit lower because you're you're pretty flabby. It might not always be that way, but just go with my example here. There's ways that that you can use this. So you would think that after weeks and months of, of adventuring, your character's probably not going to be flabby anymore. They might, uh, they, their physique might change into rugged, you know, cause they're, they're toughening up. Um, if they're doing a lot of hard work, maybe their physique might transition to athletic. Um, when something like that happens, I don't think it's unreasonable to say, Hey, your dexterity 
increases by one or two because like you're no longer flabby right now i would be hesitant to provide like a flat out plus two bonus like that is huge again it's a d20 roll under system and ideally your max is going to be 18 so if your character's dexterity is let's say eight because he was flabby right um bumping it up to 10 is a meaningful form of progression. Hell, even bumping it up to nine is a meaningful form of progression. If they find themselves, you know, trying to run away, they they got to make deck saves. If they're too flabby to run away, they're probably going to bring the whole party down, right? So as they adventure and, and, and they get more and more used to the adventuring life, the experiences change them. Now, I don't think it explicitly states that anywhere in the uh, rules here, but it doesn't have to. The intent is what matters. So in the military, we used to call this establishing commander's intent. And that was very important because what that lets uh, leaders throughout the chain of command do is that once they understand the commander's intent, they can make uh, split decisions on the fly that align with that intent without having to bother their higher ups uh, all the time. So what that means is that you as the warden, when you're reading through these rules, definitely keep the core philosophies in mind because that is what's establishing commander's intent. Again, you're the warden, you can do whatever you want, just do whatever is most fun for your players. But with these core philosophies and in, in how this system was designed, if you keep those in mind, you'll be able to devise ways of providing that meaningful progression to players that may not be explicitly stated within the uh, uh, rule set. And that's fine. Another form of progression that you can add players is, you know, as they are getting more and more experience, maybe they learn new skills. Maybe they get additional backgrounds, right? So if we look at our backgrounds table, you got stuff like alchemist, cleric, uh, hunter, miner, outlaw, smuggler, uh, ranger, you know, maybe as they are um, doing their, during the course of their adventures, maybe during some of their downtime while they're waiting for, you know, one of their companions to heal, maybe somebody might want to learn how to heal people. So they might, uh, they might become an apprentice uh, like alchemist or herbalist or, or cleric or something like that in their, their spare time. They can gain those skills and backgrounds. The same goes with their character traits. Obviously, we went through the, the example of like, you know, flabby turning to a, a rugged physique, maybe gaining some dexterity. Um, other character traits can also change over time a, as well. So, for example, if like, say for section eight, your, your vice, maybe they start out as aggressive, but they've kind of tempered their uh, demeanor down. Maybe they'll, they'll just, uh, maybe they, they will lose that, that, that vice, especially if it's something that, that the player doesn't feel like role playing, um, they could potentially lose that that vice that might be a form of progression uh, maybe they that might turn to vengeful if uh, they were fighting a boss and that boss got away maybe it stole something from them you know you could change their their vice to vengeful so that might be cool stuff to do so those are some meaningful forms of progression in the cairn system and while you might not think it important, I think uh, skills and background are much more important in Cairn than, than they would be in like a d and or, or Pathfinder, at least from a pure mechanics perspective. What I mean by that, look at the uh, section fiction first. Dice do not always reflect an obstacle's difficulty or its outcome. Instead, success or failure are arbitrated by the warden in dialogue with the players based on in-world elements. So what that means, is if your character has a hunter background, right? And maybe your enemy took off through the woods. It wouldn't be unreasonable to say, hey, Warden, um, since my character is has the hunter background, could I try to track where they went? Like look for, for broken twigs, like paths in the grass, um, things like that. As a Warden, I would say absolutely. And I wouldn't even have to have them roll for it because they have that background. They they know what they're doing. That is a skill that the player possesses. It shouldn't be a a roll. If it's something to where like they spend a bunch of time deciding what to do and then the trail's going cold, or maybe it's like it, it's it's been a few days, there might be some sort of risk or just iffiness to it. I might make them make a certain save, but 
again, most things in Cairn don't require a dice roll to see if it succeeds. The, the common way that I play Cairn at my table is my players tell me what they want to do. If it's something that they should feasibly be able to do, again, whether it's because an item they have, it's, it's in their background, or it's a trait they have, um, they just do it. If they could come up with a reason why they should be able to do it, then I usually let them do it. If it's something, again, to where it's risky, I'll have them make a save for it. So say, for example, if they're trying to sweet talk somebody and like they have the gregarious virtue, right? They, if they have that character trait, people will be more inclined to like them and then they'll often want to help them out. That's a way to do it. However, if that person is uh, is not that way, <laughs> if there's something to where like they have a shabby appearance or their speech is not very good, people probably won't listen to that person. So playing to the character strengths, I think should always be rewarded in, in some way. So with that philosophy in mind, again, skills, traits, and backgrounds, those are also a meaningful form of progression. It's not really specified in the uh, uh, Karen rule set, but I think it's still important to to keep track of that, especially as a warden when you're playing a long term campaign and you know your characters go through. Scars are not the only form of progression within Cairn, and you might also uh, try to help out a uh, a character. So, for example, I was I was playing my my guards adventure with my boys, and uh, my son got a lot of scars. He kept he kept succeeding on his strength saves to to keep fighting, and even though his strength got down to three, dude was almost dead. <laughs> His strength got down to three. He still kept succeeding on those damn strength saves. So he still kept, he was still in the fight. So every time he would take damage, he would roll for another scar. Now these scars he was getting, it was only like the uh, first three. So, you know, he started out with like, I think two hit protection. So the, the first few scars, you roll a 1d6. And then if that... No, if that result is higher than your total hit protection, then you take the new amount as your hit protection. So he was all excited because he thought he was going to get a lot stronger. Problem is, he was getting really unlucky and kept rolling a bunch of ones. So, you know, that was a really, really close call encounter. Like, he legit almost died. So he spent some time in the uh, infirmary for that. And it felt wrong to me that he would come out of that empty-handed. So I, as the warden, after he recovered, I say, hey... Uh, you got plus one to your, to your hip protection now. So your hip protection goes up to three. Again, not a massive buff by any means, but because Karen is such a dangerous system where, you know, the max hip protection that, that you could have is, is 18, right? Wrong. Uh, 18 is not the max hip protection. It is not explicitly stated anywhere that 18 is the max. I just interpreted the final scar as that being the max. But if you look at scar number three, you roll one D six and then add that to your maximum hip protection. So with that scar alone, you could keep adding more and more and more hip protection. So there's realistically no cap on hip protection for your player that I understand. So that was just me misunderstanding the rules. So take this next bit I talk about with a grain of salt, but I think my logic still kind of works. That is a pretty big amount. Like uh, you might be able to go up a little higher, if you want like super late game i think 18 is is the the reasonable top end for hip protection and that's just because like if you look at the uh, scars table the biggest scar that you can get is doomed so that says to me that is the highest hip protection that you should feasibly ever have depending on how long this campaign goes for it's up to your discretion as the uh, warden if you guys have been playing for several months now and you've still got players that you know if you're narratively in the story if you guys are legends by now you guys should really be legendary so if we look in the ses uh, the the section about creating monsters which is right right by scars it has a section on general principles right a Ability scores, three is deficient, six is weak, 10 is average, 14 is noteworthy, and 18 is legendary, right? 
So give average creatures three hit protection, give hardy ones six hit protection, and serious threats get ten plus hit protection, right? I think some badass legendary heroes should have above ten hit protection. Now, another form of like progression is I wouldn't really call it progression, but like uh armor. Like so armor plays a big role, right? So the armor in Cairn is capped at three. And I would not raise it any higher than that because uh, that still adds that sense of danger so that even some lowly peasant with a pitchfork can still deal damage to you. It's not it's not that case in like D&D &D and uh, Pathfinder to where your your armor class or whatnot is just so high. I think d and is probably a little more realistic in, in that manner to where, you know, maybe you could possibly get a hit in on, on a, a higher level character, but... Not Pathfinder. Like, Pathfinder, it's mathematically impossible to hit somebody when they have, you know, 40 armor class and you only have, like, plus 4 to hit. So your max is 24. You're never going to deal damage to them. But some ways that you can provide progression in terms of, like, armor is that you can provide them with maybe they find a cool set of armor that's like super light you know think maybe like uh when when bilbo gets that set of uh, a mithril in lord of the rings um that's high quality stuff also super light so maybe they can have uh armor that doesn't take up a ton of inventory space it's not super bulky but provides them that that three armor and gives them that benefit of inventory space. Now, inventory space, I think, is probably one of the more meaningful forms of progression that you could use in Cairn. So again, in, in Cairn, you have 10 item slots. And if those slots are all full, your hit protection goes to zero because you are over encumbered. You can't reasonably fight and dodge attacks and stuff like that when you're packing uh, tons of stuff on your back. Now, some long-term progression that I could add to players is that they might get relics or magic items that uh, maybe help reduce the need for all that uh for for more inventory space what i mean by that is like spell casting is a really good example so spell casting you have to have a spell book there's one inventory slot you've got to hold it in both hands when you use it technically that is another inventory slot um, because how the the system realistically works is you have two slots for your hands two slots for your body, and then six slots for your backpack. If you have to hold it in, in both hands, just technically taking up two while you're using it, and then when you're done uh, casting that spell, it adds a point of fatigue, which takes up an, an inventory slot. Maybe you can have a really cool high-end like caster item. Maybe it's like a special ring that um, can... Uh, absorb up to three slots of fatigue uh, for spell casting only. So when you cast a spell, it goes to your ring and not your actual inventory. And then how you would um, clear up those slots for the ring is maybe you have to do like some sort of like ritual or something like that, something meaningful. I noticed that if you look in the Karen rules, for relics. Relics are items imbued with a magical spell or power. They do not cause fatigue. Relics usually have a limited use as well as a recharge condition. A few examples. So the examples they they give, let's take a look at the uh, Staff of Silence, right? That's only got one charge. This blackened rod temporarily disables all magic within 50 feet. To recharge it, you have to bathe it in the light of a full moon. So that means that you can only use that once, like maybe once or twice a month, if you remember to bathe it in the light of a full moon. <laughs> if you just go if you just go to sleep and then forget about it, you're screwed. If your warden uh, forgets of the, if your warden for some reason is not tracking the the moon cycles, um, <laughs> which they probably won't be to be honest, but you as the player have to to remind them of that probably. You won't be able to use that very often. So even having one, two, or three inventory slots to be able to cast spells just on a ring item that maybe only takes up one slot is huge. It would have to be at least two, otherwise it'd be a waste of a ring. Like, oh, this 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 ring that takes up one slot allows you to use one fatigue slot when you cast spells. Like, why not just not use the ring and just keep that spot clear for fatigue? <laughs> so you, you get the idea. Now, looking at the rules as written, there are, there are some items that give you more inventory slots. So, for example, a cart gives you four extra slots. A mule gives you six extra slots. I don't see anything in the rules as written that would prevent a wizard 
from having a herd of mules <laughs> packing a bunch of spell books and you know whenever they want to cast a spell they have the mule carry the fatigue rules as written that seems possible however in the spirit of it after reading the guiding philosophies i don't think that that would be a realistic thing so i as a warden would not allow that at my table um it's a cool idea but if you have something like a cart or a pack animal that says to me that i have some items that i don't want to lose but i i might not need them right now so i'm only going to carry with me what i need that way if i get separated from that cart or that that mule i'll still have resources available in my in my pack so providing items or relics that can give you more inventory slots on your person is a big deal in games like pathfinder and and D, &D inventory be, uh, a lot of people just treat that like an afterthought um, because I'll admit it is tedious, especially like Pathfinder, if you're trying to track bulk and, and, and stuff like that, that is just not what I want to do. <laughs> so I typically ignore that. I think a lot of GMs and, and DMs will just give their players like a bag of holding and they can just keep yeeting everything in there. I don't think that is a realistic thing to do with Cairn because of how it, how it relies on the inventory space as a key mechanic especially for spell casting and uh fatigue and deprivation so a meaningful form of progression for cairn might be items that again give them like one or two extra uh inventory slots on their person that would be huge you know especially for like a magic user that has maybe maybe they're packing three different spell books right um and maybe they have a, a cool staff that they, they use for a weapon that does, you know, maybe 1d6 or 1d8 damage normally if they're swinging it. But then it has like, you know, uh, maybe that staff can be treated as a, uh, a spell book. Maybe that staff can cast spells, but it still costs fatigue. So that could be one cool way of, uh, of adding progression. Maybe you can have a, a staff that can hold up to two different spells. Two different spells that you know. So you would have to have studied the uh, spell books and that way you can use your staff as like one slot. Uh, I guess technically two, cause you got to carry it in, in, in both hands, but you have two spell books that you don't have to carry around anymore. And that gives you more inventory space to allocate to fatigue. So you can utilize those, those spells more. That would be a huge meaningful progression uh four characters what i'm trying to say is like there's there's lots of ways that you can add progression in cairn but it just might not be immediately apparent just from reading the rules as written i think page number one is the most important page i mean pages two and three uh are pretty important too because they kind of give you the principles for wardens and the principles for players those are also very important but the overall design philosophies of the system is very important. So with that in mind, we've talked about number go up. We've talked about uh, skills, traits, abilities. You have the option of getting more of those. Um, it might not seem like as pronounced as like the D&D and, and Pathfinder where you know, there's tons of different skills, a ton of different classes. You know, as a druid, you might get more wild shape forms, or maybe you can cast hurricanes and like, you know, awesome nature spells, and maybe you can heal people. Uh, and all that stuff is just part of your your kit. That's a pretty big, meaningful progression. Whereas Cairn, the magic in in Cairn, ah, you know what? Let me look through the through the spells here. So looking through the hundred spells that that they give you in the book, uh, there's. I think there's a bunch more on the website. I think there's a total of 666 nice uh, spells on there. Most of these spells, though, they're not like spells in D&D and Pathfinder where they deal damage. They're just spells that do things. Like babble. You can make somebody babble inconsolably uh, to, so they can just they just keep talking nonstop so, so maybe they can't do anything else like cast another spell at you. So that's one way to, to disable people. Um, frenzy. You could cast Frenzy on somebody and make them uh, do a lot more stuff. Uh, flare. You can light the uh, area. Earthquake. You can really uh, shake the place up. But it's, there's nothing in the rules that explicitly states like, oh, you know, uh, target must uh, make a save or they take 2d8 damage or something like that. So spells are really rare, but also really important in, in, in Cairn because there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with them 
that again can completely overcome or trivialize a hard encounter um and i think players should be rewarded for using them and uh they're not spells that you can just keep casting like cantrips in uh, pathfinder or or dnd like you, you know you you have a warlock that can just keep spamming out eldritch blast non-stop you can't do that in uh cairn but i don't think that that's a requirement uh to be able to do that in uh to have a meaningful long-term progression campaign all right so we, we talked about number go up we talked about skills abilities traits all that stuff the other thing uh the other two things were itemization we covered that uh a little bit there's some items that you can uh make up in cairn that provide meaningful a meaningful progression i mean such things that might give inventory slots or uh really cool effects that might help the entire party so items are going to be huge you know uh, a lightweight armor set that gives you three armor which is the uh, max so maybe you don't have to have a slot taken up by a helmet and a bulky brigandine and a shield you just went from four slots taken up to one like that is a pretty damn big meaningful form of progression so itemization in cairn is very important and then the final one that i was talking about was like storyline narrative uh world building storytelling so with that with with that one i think cairn's got that nailed because Karen is so lightweight that there's almost no barrier to letting you and your players tell your story. Because, again, it's it's not just the warden that's making up the story. It's the players that, are, that have equal, if not more important roles in shaping the story because it's about their characters. So I think it's important for a long-term campaign to have them create characters that they really enjoy. So maybe you wouldn't do the fully randomized character creation um, for Cairn. I think the randomized characters is really good when you're starting out, especially if you're just first learning the uh, system, because it gives you some really fun, wacky combos. Like my buddy, when he rolled his character Harper, I've never seen someone have fun with imaginary marbles in a tabletop RPG in my life. <laughs> it was so much fun. So... But after the after your players get a feel for, for the Cairn system, and if they really like it, um, and they want to do a long-term campaign with it, as the Warden, I would really let them make their own characters that they are excited about. So, you know, they might randomize some character that's maybe not what they want to play at all. Maybe it's uh, they want to play a good character, but maybe it's they roll somebody who's aggressive, repulsive, condemned has a cryptic speech, their face is bony, they're bald, and they look like a necromancer, right? That's probably not the character they want to play. So I would let the players, of course, make the characters that they want to play, that they are excited about. And of course, with any long-term campaign, you as the warden want to sit down with your players and and figure out what kind of experiences that your players are going to go after. Do they do they want more combat encounters? Do they want something to where maybe they're not good guys? Maybe they're just people who just want to make money, and and uh, you know maybe they're kind of crooks or smugglers or thieves maybe they want more puzzles maybe they want uh more mystery intrigue dialogue role play karen can do all of that right and especially for a long-term campaign the only limiting factor is you as the warden in brainstorming ideas and i think that there's tons of resources online so if you ever get uh uh you know brain fog or you're just stuck in a rut and you just can't think of anything there's tons of resources on the uh, Cairn site itself, but also you can just take ideas like what I've been doing for my adventures. I've been robbing stuff of like video games I've played, like Bethesda games, like Elder Scrolls. Like I've been taking a lot of stuff from that and it's been working great, you know? <laughs> so a lot of cool ideas that you can have and it's super easy to take something from one system and customize that encounter to work with Cairn. You know, especially if you're looking at the uh, creating monster section, it gives you all the the guidelines you need there. So it gives you the general principles of what their ability score should be, their hit protection. Um, you can use flavor and style them and help them stand out. Uh, you can also leverage uh, critical damage to really make it a threat or a strangeness of any aggressive NPC. Yeah, so I think it's super easy to make encounters with Cairn, which means that me as the warden, I don't have to spend as much time preparing content for my long-term campaign, which means that I won't be burnt out as much as if I was preparing stuff for Pathfinder. Cause I'll tell you what, I spend about a 
tenth of the time preparing content for Cairn that I did preparing stuff for for Pathfinder. But with that, with those four pillars of of progression, number go up, stats, traits, skills, itemization, and storytelling, narrative, campaign setting, world building, all that stuff. I think with just those four alone, you have all the tools you need within the Cairn system to make a long-term campaign that provides meaningful progression, that players will still feel engaged and excited about playing their their characters, and give them new innovative challenges that keep them interested for the next session. Now, I would love to do a long-term campaign with Cairn because I primarily play with my sons. My youngest is 10. It's kind of hard to get a 10-year-old these days to focus on something that long. So judging by the fact that we've already rolled, I think, like six characters for him, <laughs> I don't envision we're going to be doing a long-term campaign anytime soon. But you never know. I might, I might get some friends together and we might do a long-term campaign. I would love to do, like, recorded sessions of Cairn. I would love to do that. I just, I don't know if I have enough people near me that are comfortable enough to, you know, be on camera. Because even though I am a YouTuber, I signed up to be ridiculed on the internet, which doesn't, which thankfully hasn't happened very much yet. People are very, very cool, and, and I, I appreciate that. Um, that might not be the same for everybody, you know? So me, I'm a huge Critical Role fan. I've watched all of Campaign 1, all of Campaign 2. Uh, I still have to get caught up on the uh, last episode or two of, of Campaign 3. I watched, like, all the uh, Exandria Unlimited stuff. And I remember in the early days, especially in Campaign 1, like, uh, when they were still on Geek and & Sundry and, and the live streams were, like, a bit rougher. I know that I remember seeing a lot of comments of, of some of the players getting hate. You know, especially, uh... Tiberius, who's no longer on, who who is no longer on Critical Role, and uh, even uh, Marisha, oh, she was playing her character Keyleth. Um, there were some moments, you know, during her story that I didn't really like, but you know, it's what she wanted to do. But she was getting a lot of hate online about it uh, in the uh, comments, and you know, I'm not saying that I'm ever going to be as big as Critical Role. That's not the goal or the intention at all. Um, but if anybody wanted to do that with me, I they would have to have the understanding that that could be a possibility, and I don't want to. I don't want to to put that strain on my my friendships. Currently, right now, I'm just playing. Karen because I love the system and I, I love being with them and playing with them and we have a good time. I mean, last time I played with my friend whose character was what was Harper. Oh my God, dude, my jaw hurt from like laughing and smiling so much. Like it was my, my face hurt because we were having such a good time. And while yes, that would be really good content that I can record and put up on YouTube. I don't want to lessen that experience or cheapen it when, when we're in the moment, just having a good wholesome experience. So I think that if I ever did uh, recorded sessions, I would have to have players at my table or virtual table that understood that. And while I'm not playing this just for content, uh, it would be it would be awesome to make more content about it. But that's kind of the pickle that I'm in right now. So a lot of people have been asking me for more more Karen content, and uh, you know I would love to give a lot more Karen content, but. I, I don't necessarily know if I want to drag everybody I know in with me, you know? <laughs> so, anyway, those are my thoughts. Uh, can Cairn be used for a long campaign? I absolutely believe so. What are your thoughts? I would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, do you have any any additional ideas for ways of doing progression in Cairn for a long-term campaign? Do you see some pitfalls with some of, of my logic? Um, are there things that could be improved? Are there small changes or tweaks or homebrew rules that you would do to, uh, to do for a, a long-term campaign? Um, I know, if, I know one thing I would do, I'd probably use a bigger character sheet that had more notes because these are going to fill up really quick. So, um, I mean, even like when you just roll your, your basic character, like your notes section is going to be filled in pretty rapidly. Um, just from your background, like you're rolling for like eight different traits, you know, you've got a background. So there's nine, nine slots in your notes right there. 
uh, not inventory, but but nine things you got to write down in your notes. And then as you progress and you gain more skills, you're going to have to write those down. So I think uh, probably... Maybe I might try to design a character sheet for a long-term campaign. Maybe that that could be a, a cool project I might do. But anyway, let me know your thoughts. Again, I appreciate the feedback. Uh, I, I love the engagement that I've been getting. Uh, you know, people commenting that they, uh, their thoughts and opinions on the system, even some people who have d uh, uh, dissenting opinions that, that maybe don't think the uh, Karen system is so good. By all means, comment. I, I read everything, and uh, I love it. So anyway, thank you so much for listening to me ramble. I appreciate it, and I'll see you in whatever video I make next.